Good morning, everyone. Tim Nyland here, SACS Professional Services, weekly internal strategy call. Uh, the date is September 16th of 2020. We have had a very, very active news week. And um, I've been watching the ISM Manufacturing, Non-Manufacturing Index, as well as the Manufacturing Index. And we've also recently received confirmation from the Empire State Manufacturing Index and others that the economic rebound actually is remaining on solid footing. And I just wanted to show this chart in the Zach's research system. Uh, it's one that I actually created as a custom graph in the economic section of the Zach's research system, and I just called it U.S. production. The neat thing is, is when you create charts in any one of these one to four panel interactive or economic, you actually build out your own product because your charts actually become part of the system menu here. And you can see my U.S. production chart here. So ISM manufacturing index, ISM non-manufacturing index on the bottom panel. And keep in mind here that anything above 50 is expansionary. So you can see that that we were already on a downhill slide here from basically the middle of 2018 on the manufacturing index. Um, the Institute of Supply Management is who puts this survey out, and they're actually located here in Tempe, Arizona. And it's a very simple survey. They literally randomly call up manufacturing businesses, and they basically ask them, hey, is your manufacturing up or down from last month? And it's a very, very simple survey, yet very, very effective. This is a really, really solid leading indicator that the Federal Reserve actually used when uh, determining interest rate policy. You'll notice that any time these indicators begin to approach 50 or actually breach the 50 level, which is contraction, that the Federal Reserve typically responds with some sort of policy response. And you can actually see that from this downhill slide, we actually started a little bit of a recovery here in 2019 and then ended up falling off a cliff during COVID. Uh, things certainly got a little bit, a little scary. And then obviously the, the Federal Reserve basically went to QE infinity. And you can see the impact that that's had. Um, obviously this is, this is more or less all QE driven. Uh, but this, this, recovery is solid. You got 56 reads on both ISM manufacturing and non-manufacturing index. Um, the implications and the reason why I'm commenting on this today, these, norm these numbers normally come out around the first of the month, is that we got a consumer spending read that actually slipped below forecast this month for August. And that is that retail sales um, only increased 0.6. And it was actually driven in part by higher gasoline prices and the supported receipts at those service stations. So that's not a good sign for the health of the consumer. Uh, the forecast was for a 1% increase. So that's actually a miss. And the one thing I wanted to comment on um, that's, that's, that's encouraging to me is that the next round of COVID stimulus uh, appears to be getting uh, some attention from Nancy Pelosi and, and, and all of Congress. And actually, as of this morning, it appears as though Trump is now willing to look at a larger stimulus package in an effort to get this deal done. So this is obviously going to be big because it's it's really key to putting money in the hands of consumers um, that have been hurt in the services sector of our economy. For those of us with you know blue collar jobs, we don't feel it as much, but obviously those in the restaurant uh, and the bar, uh, hotel industry, and other service industries have have literally. Uh, been feeling the pain. So these, this next round of COVID stimulus is going to be key. So if, if and when that happens, um, you know, really look for this to be another shot in the arm. The other thing that's obviously driving this is uh, the very favorable interest rate environment that we're in. And we're actually going to talk a little bit more about that here in just a few minutes based on the back of another Wall Street Journal article uh, that I found within the last week. Next thing I want to talk about is the relative strength index. And this is actually off of the back of my webinar last week on Wednesday. Uh, it seems as though we might have had somebody from the Wall Street Journal either listen to the webinar or was listening in. Not sure how that would happen, but at any rate, um, the very next day they published their own RSI article. Believe it or not, um, we beat them again. And this time, though, they were using a 70-30 split on the overbought, oversold indicators. Remember, um, I had recommended the 80-20 threshold 
The problem with a 70-30 threshold with the relative strength index, and I've talked to many a hedge funds about this, is that when you're building watch lists, especially daily, um, you know, you can leave money on the table on the overbought side because a lot of times, as soon as you breach 70, that's nowhere near the top and the momentum really continues beyond that. Uh, so you can definitely leave money on the overbought side. Uh, and then on the way down, you can, you can, you can catch a falling knife is, is the way we, the way we term it. Um, uh, because these stocks, when they're falling, they'll typically breach 30 and head towards 20. So the closer you can get to 20, um, the better you, the better odds you're going to have at an actual reversal. Um, keep in mind that. Um, the RSI doesn't always work in practice, that, um, that it is a guidepost. The real meat of this article and what I really want to talk about is, is the, the title itself. Tech investors should worry about what happens after the lockdown ends. And this, this bothers me because it obviously spurs a lot of emotion. And a lot of this is obviously not true. So what we want to do is we want to challenge articles that we read like this. We don't want to fall into this fear trap. And so what we're going to do is we're going to remove the um, emotion from the article. And I'm going to cite um, the CEO of Adobe was actually speaking on CNBC this morning. And when he was asked about this specifically, he stated that you are not going to put this genie back in the bottle. Um, specifically speaking with regard to the entire, um, you know, cloud um, publishing industry, the CEO of Adobe stated that there's simply too much content being created and there's simply too much content being consumed, that this is basically a new world and a new economy. And so what I want to do at this point is take a look at my trusty spreadsheet on the S&P 500 performance that, as I've mentioned in prior webinars, I look at once a month, uh, around the middle of each month, I look at it once a month without fail. And the last time I re revisited this SP5 performance spreadsheet was on August 7th. And so since August 7th, we've had a large run-up in tech and then we've had obviously a precipitous sell-off in tech so what i wanted to do was compare the leadership group and the actual top five names market cap as a percent of the s p 500 and then i also wanted to do the test of taking the bottom x number of names market cap to see what it would actually take in terms of weight to equal the top five names and so if we look at the result of this from my August 7th study that we've already discussed, you'll recall that Apple was roughly 6.5%, followed by Microsoft at about 5.5%, Amazon at about 5.5%, and, and then we go down to Google at 3.4, Facebook at 2.5. The top five names market cap as a percent of the S&P 500 was 23.25%. If you take and go down to the bottom of this spreadsheet that's all 500 names in the S&P 500 and you start rolling up the market caps, it takes literally the bottom 370 names market cap to equate to the top five. The top five weight in the S&P 500 makes up the bottom 370 names by market cap in the S&P 500. This was as of August 7th. So if we have this large exodus from tech that everyone's fearing and we have this value rotation that everybody's talking about, now keep in mind, I am starting to see some value rotation, but it's only happening in the quality names. Look at Disney, look at Starbucks. Oh, and by the way, they're all part of the earning certain portfolio. The earning certain portfolio is performing extremely well. We've got in the core 75 group, we've got 40 names that are subject to some reopening phenomenon. Two of the highest quality names, Starbucks and Disney, both have been on the rise lately as this value rotation has begun to emerge. Okay. Now, if 
we were going to be looking at a massive rotation to value, one would think that in order for value to rotate, we would have to give up some percentage of this top five tech market cap in order for valuation or in order for value to rotate, because this is obviously growth. Okay. Let's roll the tape forward to what is today, Wednesday. So I did this on 914. Okay. So I did it yesterday and utilized Monday's closing price. So that was 914. I want you to see that in exactly one month and one week, there has been virtually no change in the percentage of the top five names market cap as a percentage of the S&P 500. And by the way, when we roll up the bottom X number of names market cap to arrive at the top five, it still equals the weight of the bottom 370. So if we have a lot of value names at the bottom, which we do that are starting to rotate, you would think that some of the money would come out of the top five tech and go into the bottom 370. It hasn't happened. So here's your 23.04. Back in August, we were at 23.25. I would call it pretty much a wash. Okay. Next thing I want to talk about is bond yield. This is something that I found in yesterday's Wall Street Journal. Uh, this is a good article, but I have a much better chart. And the Wall Street Journal article only covers a half the story and does not cover the most important part of the story. And that is the combined effect of not only what's going on with treasury yields, but also equity risk premium and total equity discount rate. For those of you that have heard this pitch from me before, I apologize. It'll only take a minute. Uh, but even if you have, I recommend you listen to it again because this is extremely important and is literally what's driving the entire stock market right now. Um, I'm going back into the Zach's research system and I went into my quick analysis pitch book here, which is the default pitch book. And I literally just ran down and grabbed Zach's equity risk premium. And in order to get the full picture, since this is a default pitch book, um, I need to come down to this. EPS actual and estimates panel and swap this out for the actual 10 year yield, which we're going to do now. Keep in mind, again, these webinars are live. This is internal strategy and um, is part of our training that we do for internal staff as well. And so, what I want to do is I want to use the Zach's earning certain portfolio up here as, the, as my market portfolio. And I do that because that's really what the earnings certain portfolio was designed as a real market portfolio of earnings certain stocks. So we know with certainty where earnings are going to be one year forward. And I want you to see this nice inverse correlation that the PE on a forward 12 month basis has with equity risk premium. So as equity risk premium, in other words, macroeconomic headline risk rises as it did in the Great Recession, obviously PE multiples contract. And then as we have a cessation in equity risk premium, in other words, equity risk premium starts trending down, then we start getting multiple expansion, which is what we're experiencing now. Um, keep in mind, equity risk premiums, a series that I calculate, I've been calculating this series now for 25 plus years. It basically measures the flow of funds between the risk-free basket of securities and the equity basket of securities. And what it allows us to do is determine whether or not basically PEs within their current range are in fact justifiable. And when we look at where we're at with the current PE multiple on the earnings certain portfolio standing at 23, you'll see that our current equity risk premium of 3.79, we can trace this all the way back to basically 2007, but you'll see that we were only trading at a multiple of 19 in 2007 at this current level of risk of equity risk premium and you can see that we've actually taken the PE multiple expansion to a whole nother level by notching it up to 23 so what could possibly explain that because equity risk premium obviously doesn't explain that in its entirety and you can see exactly what explains that when you compare the level of 10-year treasury yield at that same point in 2007 so if we look at 
this 379 on equity risk premium and we draw the line all the way back here to when we hit 379 last time we had a pe of 19 we also had 10-year treasury rates at i could turn on my indicators and actually show you at about five percent which led to a total equity discount rate when you combine equity risk premium plus the 10-year treasury yield so that's risk-free rate on the 10-year plus the premium that investors require just to be in the equity market that's what equity risk premium is we had a total equity discount rate of 9.12 roughly thereabouts there it is right there at 630.07 a nine percent total equity discount rate well wouldn't it make sense if the 10-year treasury has literally collapsed and the federal reserve has basically promised to not increase rates for the next several years that we would take another step up in pe multiple expansion and as a matter of fact that's exactly what's happened take a look at where the 10-year is now on an equity risk premium of 379 we've got 10-year treasury yields sitting at 0.65 well back in 07 we were at five percent okay so we've got a total equity discount rate back in 07 of over nine percent we've literally cut that in half to 4.52 is that justification for pe multiples to expand from 19 to 23 absolutely and that is exactly what's driving this multiple expansion okay so more than happy to review this with anyone on an individual basis just reach out to me uh, there's a lot more that we could obviously discuss but i'm going to go ahead and move on uh to a bombshell that was dropped uh sunday night for those of you that actually have your financial market alerts set up on your phone uh, it was no coincidence that you received notifications of the arm slash nvidia merger on sunday night uh, and for good reason I mean, this is a huge huge merger um, and there's obviously a lot of things going on in the semiconductor industry so 5g and covid related work from home we've already talked about adobe's take on content creation content consumption this is literally driving a shift in demand for semiconductors um, i've heard that again I, i've said this before uh, the next one year chip demand is estimated to be at one trillion chips and i'm not talking about pringles or sour cream and onion i'm talking about computer processors all right so assume that the global population is around 7 billion or so that's literally 130 chips per man woman and child in the world okay, this is massive the semiconductor sector is literally moving from a cyclical sector now to a growth sector and it's primarily being driven from high performance gpus cpus and the high speed interconnects um, it's being driven from artificial intelligence to quantum computing uh gamers uh literally especially with COVID, have just come out of the woodwork doubling and tripling their gaming time they're demanding lifelike gaming experiences and um, it's largely nvidia and their gpus that are delivering that uh, autonomous vehicles uh, every day it seems like a new autonomous vehicle company is being formed and the number of chips in these autonomous vehicles i should say electric vehicles um, is just uh, astounding uh, the related data storage that goes along with the the artificial intelligence quantum computing needs uh, autonomous driving especially uh, the related data storage is just is just insurmountable it's just massive and it just requires a ton of computing power any sort of cryptocurrency farming cloud related business shifts the internet of things so there's literally at least one chip in nearly everything that you have electronic be it you know your your fitbits your your apple watches anything uh, there's just chip there's even chips in in our credit cards now so we've got we've got a couple big players and there's there's a couple different chipsets that i want to talk about in order for everybody to understand what's going on in this space i'm going to try to summarize this as as, as much as i can so that it's easy to understand. So Intel and AMD have been battling in the core, what we call the x86 CPU chipset market for years, right? So these are the chips that are 
basically used in laptops and servers. And remember that back in March of this year, I, I told everyone, you know, to basically run for the hills from their from their Intel stock. Um, that AMD was in the process of crushing Intel, that they were already delivering on their seven nanometer fab cycle. And, and lo and behold, if Intel didn't drop a bombshell, uh, in their latest quarter when they reported by saying that they were basically behind on their seven nanometer fab cycle on the x86 chip. And that's when Intel really fell apart. That's when AMD gapped up. It's gapped up several times since. And, um, and look for AMD to literally continue to crush Intel over the next several years. So Intel and their downfall is that not only do they design their own chips, they manufacture their own chips. And so they themselves fell on their own sword by falling behind on their fabrication cycle. And the, the, you know, AMD is basically the designer. They're the chip designer and they utilize Taiwan Semiconductor, which is the world's largest semiconductor manufacturer to, to fabricate their chips. Uh, Xbox and PlayStations are both coming out with new consoles this year. And guess what? They're using AMD chips manufactured by Taiwan Semi. So, NVIDIA owns the GPU market, right? So they're serving all the data storage, AI, gaming, autonomous vehicle market. Now, with NVIDIA wanting to own ARM, it's going to add not only to NVIDIA's leadership in the GPU market, but is also going to make NVIDIA the leader in the cell phone chip market because that is the nature of where ARM processors are used. So anything that requires a super, super energy efficient chip is basically going to utilize this ARM processor technology. So that would be, you know, your Fitbits, your Apple Watches, uh, certainly cell phones. Um, they need to basically sip energy, not consume energy through, you know, a huge, you know, power cord that you plug into a 110 volt outlet. Um, that's the nature of ARM in, in layman's terms. So hopefully that that summarized it for you. So the idea is that that AMD and NVIDIA are literally poised to dominate everything hardware related. And this obviously has implications for our tilts, right? So if I roll the tape back to some of the decisions I made in my own personal portfolio back in 2012 when I was buying Facebook at $17 a share, look, I know that NVIDIA and AMD look expensive now. But when we look at where semiconductors are going to go in the next 10 years, um, NVIDIA is cheap and so is AMD. And AMD has just an absolute ton of, of upside potential. So the idea is this does have implications for our tilts. Um, these are higher beta names, and I'm looking at ways we can work them into our tilts. Um, the idea is, from a portfolio manager's perspective, is when we when we look at recommending tilts for a strategic portfolio like the earning certain portfolio family or any core equity portfolio the idea is we don't want to worry ourselves with picking lead horses in specific markets like electric vehicle vehicles wearables cell phones you know we've already got apple in there as a tilt we know that they're dominant um the idea is that you can own nvidia and amd and literally cover 90 percent of the tuck hardware market. And I'm just trying to share with you, you know, how I envision tilts. They're much more strategic versus trying to go in and, and just pick individual winners. The theme with AMD and NVIDIA is very clear and their market dominance uh, is only going to grow. So with that, I want to talk a little bit about the ever anticipating, the ever anticipated, I should say, um, rebalance that's coming up at the end of the month for the earning certain portfolios. Uh, I should say the earning certain family of portfolios. So earning certain portfolios obviously been performing extremely well, and so has the Admiral portfolio. And I've got those on the screen again in the Zach's research system, just going into the into the price and earnings charts and just taking a look at the price action. Um, it's just been incredible. 
and disregard this FY3 number. There's just simply not enough sample out here in FY3 across these 75 companies to even to even concern ourselves with what's going on that far out. Um, what I've done is I've put several companies on um, on the removal list, and I've got obviously many that are on watch. And I started the evaluation process several weeks ago, around the 1st of September. And so what I want to do is I want to show you, I've created a composite of the five stocks that we are going to remove from the earning certain family of portfolios. And I want to show you the combined earnings effect that these five stocks have on the earning certain portfolio. So these five stocks as a single entity look like this. And you can see why they're being removed. And this is not necessarily just a, a reopening phenomenon. These firms have had real structural issues they've been facing for quite some time. And so I'm going to show you the ones that we are going to remove now. And the first one that I, I really struggled with removing, they've been a member of the earning certain portfolio since day one, is Campbell Soup. Uh, they have gone through several identity crises, and they've they've gone through a lot of generational demand shifts. And I was hoping that this time would be different, but it looks as though um, we're going to continue to have issues with with Campbell Soup and not being a real earning certain uh, stock any longer. So I'm going ahead and removing Campbell Soup. Um, John Wiley, same same scenario, publishing company. Um, you know, the nature of education is changing and uh, the manner in which we're actually consuming all of this information is changing. And um, I think it's time that we abandon John Wiley as well, for obvious reasons. Um, Raytheon. Raytheon was the result of a merger with United Technologies. And I let it go for one or two quarters and we're going to go ahead and remove it. It's just a, it's a bellwether industrial name. And there's better companies out there for us to get exposure to. Um, Walgreens Boots, similar to CVS. Um, obviously, we're best of breed for many, many years. Again, this company had been in, in the earning certain portfolio for, for years and years and years. And um, issues with margins, issues with Express Scripts and other things. It's, it's just time to abandon this name, no longer uh, of earning certain caliber. And I think that it'll really drive this issue home when I show you the additions that have reached the top of my list. And again, I reserve the right to make changes to this list anytime prior to the end of the month. I'm still evaluating a myriad of companies, but I've come down, I've basically come down to these five names. In aggregate, uh, this is what the five names that I'm looking at adding look like on a price and earnings basis. So obviously much more solid earnings picture here versus the removals. Again, I'll put those on the screen so you can see the five names we're removing uh, and how we expect that this is going to continue to drive performance uh, you know, for years to come. I, I don't like turnover in these portfolios, so anything that we do uh, is, not, is not taken lightly. These are holdings that we plan on holding for years and years and years. So let's take a look at some of the additions that have reached the top of my list, okay? Uh, the first one is Lindy PLC. Uh, this is literally a bellwether uh, industrial gas and engineering company. So all your welding, nitrogen, it's, it's literally the old Praxair. And um, just, just a spectacular name, uh, spectacular earning stability, always has been, and it's time to add them uh, to the earning certain family. So again, top of my list. Another one is a consumer staples name that was Obviously, a hyper growth name has now settled down to a nice solid, you know, 11, 12 percent growth rate. And um, I love having these types of staples names in the portfolio. And um, so Monster, Monster Beverage reached the, the top of my list. Another name that's absolutely spectacular uh, is Mettler Toledo. Uh, these guys are in the healthcare industry. They make precision instruments, weigh, uh, weighing instruments specifically, and um, and they also do a lot in the um, in the detection of metals and packaging and stuff like that. The um, when when this when this name came up and and I was doing my analysis on it, 
um, it, it was spectacular to actually look at, at the profitability on this name. Uh, it's not very often that you run into uh, ROEs that, that just are, are absolutely mind boggling and just continue to grow. Um, return on equity in excess of 100%. Um, these guys are just literally firing on all cylinders. And I don't really see any reason why that's going to change. So again, Mettler Toledo rising to the top of my list. Next one is, let's see what that one is. It's ResMed, I think. So ResMed is really, really big in cloud connected devices for daily health monitoring. And I think that, you know, as we look out, um, one of the things I love to see is, is consistent, you know, eight to 10% growth for these earning certain names like to see them blazing right through recessions unscathed. Um, you've seen the commercials on television and, and these wearable slash cloud connected devices for health monitoring, be it, you know, cardiac arrhythmia, you know, heart monitoring devices, um, glucose monitoring. Now they've got, you know, sleep apnea devices that are controlled uh, and feed information to the cloud, so sleep study. The, the 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 runway for ResMed to continue to innovate in this space is just huge. So this is another name that I really like. Um, it's definitely of earning certain caliber. The next one is is Rollins. Um, most of you are not familiar with Rollins, uh, but when I tell you what they do, you will laugh. Um, they own Orkin. They are a holding company for many many pest control companies. And um, when I say many, I mean at least a dozen. And, um, and, and these guys literally just print cash. This is very characteristic of earning certain names. You've got that, you know, seven to nine percent growth here, just solid. Um, this earnings line doesn't waver. This is literally an annuity. These guys work on contracts and they literally just, just deliver on earnings every single quarter. So again, those five names, uh, Lindy, the old prac there, Monster Beverage, Mettler Toledo, Medical Instrumentation, ResMed, again, cloud connected devices for daily health monitoring, and then obviously the parent company of Orkin, uh, which is a nice household name consistent with, uh, with the earning certain family of, of portfolios. Um, so obviously much more to come in next week's session related to the earning certain portfolio rebalance. We'll probably confirm a lot of these names next week, but I did want to tip my hand to everyone or for everyone because I have been receiving a lot of inquiries. So I'm hoping that um, anybody that's on the front line in sales and even account management, um, you know, you can start having these conversations with your clients. Um, anybody who's asking about, hey, have you considered removing this or that? You can say yes. As a matter of fact, it's it's on the list. And then, um, and obviously, these are just really, really great names as replacements. So I'm very happy with the results so far. Um, but the results um, are not confirmed again, and um, I will have them obviously completed by the end of the month. That's all I had for this week. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending, and we'll pick this up next week.